Our next honoree has pushed past the barriers to become a top executive in the television and film industry, Lisa Nishimura. Lisa is the Vice President, Original Documentary and Comedy Programming at Netflix. Netflix. What? <laughs> okay. But... <laughs> okay. So I just really like Netflix. <laughs> okay. But... In her role, Lisa is responsible for building and overseeing the slate of original documentary films and series, as well as stand-up comedy specials, available to Netflix's 109 million viewers around the world. I really enjoyed getting to know Lisa. Working in entertainment was not something on her radar as a college student, but she's glad she remained open to all these career possibilities. That's one big advice she gave me, to be open to access as much information and different points of views as you can, to allow myself to develop a rich set of experiences. Lisa shared with me that the older she gets, the more she realizes how much she can still learn. It is that curiosity that makes her great at what she does. Lisa also told me to not sweat the small stuff, just keep learning and growing. I love that. I will take this advice with me as I continue my path forward. Lisa, please join me on stage to accept your award for inspiring girls, women, to be bold, fearless, and open to many possibilities of their future. I feel I've been match made with the perfect person. <laughs> wow. Um, thank you so much for having me this special afternoon. Um, a real sincere thank you to Ambassador Avant uh, for nominating me amongst these incredibly accomplished women, uh, and in particular for introducing me to this extraordinary organization. Um, I can't tell you, I'm really, really excited because I get to talk about Donna Wong now. <laughs> um, so Donna Wong found Girls Inc. in the second grade, and what Girls Inc. did was they provided a safe after-school program for her when both of her parents were working. Um, and the program has consistently been there for Donna at really critical moments in her life. That ranged from that safe after-school program and then also extended to STEM programs, as you can see. She got extraordinarily inspired by the math and the sciences. Um, they also uh, hosted her on these incredible field trips, and this included her going whitewater rafting and surfing. And I love what she said about it. She said, um, that she would no longer let the fear of the unknown prevent her from pursuing the thrill of an adventure. Of key importance, Girls Inc. encouraged and supported Donna to find her own voice and to believe in herself and her right to pursue higher education. The Girls Inc. College Access Now program provided her with the resources and support to manage the labyrinth of pre-college testing, the maze of all those applications, and even helped her to visit various college campuses. So she would not only be reading about her potential college experience, but actually walking the halls and feeling the energy of her future. And now we get to see her here, bright, optimistic, dedicated, fierce, and full of promise. Motivated by the early loss of her grandmother to cancer and her baby cousin born with severe liver defects, she is now a freshman at UCLA studying biochemistry with her sights held high on a future in medicine through which she feels she can best help others. But to be clear, this future of Donna's was not always written. Donna and I have some shared similarities. We are both daughters of immigrants who came to this country in the hopes of a better future for their children. Her parents are of Chinese descent, both born and raised in Vietnam, and they each came to the United States where their parents arranged for them to marry. Donna was the first of three children and grew up living with her grandfather who doted and placed all of his hopes and expectations upon her brother, while often insisting that she lower her voice and avoid being brash and therefore not able to secure a good husband or be a housewife. Donna's stories are completely her own. 
And yet in listening to them, some are painfully familiar to me. In my case, having survived their childhoods during, the, during World War II in Japan, my parents came to the United States along with my older brother. They arrived in America in the 60s. This was not an ideal time for an Asian immigrant family to arrive. Through the years, I learned how their experiences during the war and then arriving into the United States at that particular moment in time shaped their lens of the world and that which they felt would be appropriate for each of their individual children. They brought with them from Japan a very strong sense of family, the conviction to education, and a hard immigrant work ethic with dreams of safety and opportunity. They also brought with them a pervasive patriarchy. Being the one and only person in my entire extended family born in the United States, I experienced a constant cultural, language, and generational gap that often left me feeling like a foreign exchange student in my own home. Similar to Donna, my father's expectations and the notion of success were quite different from me versus my brother. My brother could and would achieve the highest possible level of education as that was his right and his duty. For me, the sometimes not so subtle undertone was that pursuing academic and professional success were most helpful skills ultimately to attract a suitable husband. My parents were each loving in their own way. My father is a man of very, very few words, and his old world definition of love expressed succinctly by providing a roof over your head and a proper education. My mother was the dual reality of the day-to-day -day disciplinarian and the dispenser of hugs. My mother is an extraordinary woman, loving and supportive. However, that did not prevent her from calling me the day after I got married to ask me when I was planning to quit my job. <laughs> you know, it took me a very long time to realize that someone can genuinely love you and yet limit you at the exact same time. I have no doubt that my mother's motivation behind that call was pure, that of love and concern. She's a woman whose unpredictable course of life destined her to seek security as the ultimate prize. But this one call was emblematic of so many other small, constant, well-meaning, and yet insidious instances through my life that left me wondering whether I myself, of my own merit and my own accomplishments, could be enough. When you lack someone around you, or perhaps in some cases even worse, when someone around you is unable to see you for the whole complex person that you have the capacity to become, it can have a chilling effect. Perhaps most deeply reflected in a shrinking of one's own aperture on your own self-confidence and promise. Throughout my years at school, while outwardly I was achieving, internally this ongoing doubt filled me with an anxiety that seemed to color so many aspects of my life. I spent seemingly endless hours worrying about what I was going to do, continually trying to fulfill my parents' desire for me to establish a respectable and secure career. In today's world, what you do has become such an identifier, carrying with it an outsized social currency. I mean, think about it. If you go to a party, as soon as you learn somebody's name, what's the first thing you ask them? So what do you do? Early in my career, I think this pressure led to a significant amount of worry and anxiety about misstepping. This meant surrendering a tremendous amount of power and self-value to the notion of landing a particular job or pursuing the right career. It was only later, much, much too much later, when I began to shift my, my, my very myopic focus away from what I was going to do and focus on who I wanted to be. In doing so bit by bit, the anxiety began to recede and be replaced by excitement and a foundational sense of self. I began by asking myself, could I be joyful in challenging times? Could I be thoughtful and conscious, present, curious, and tenacious? Could I embrace change and take risks? Could I be creative, supportive, generous, and more open to others? If I challenged myself to be that person across every situation, not just with people I trusted or environments that were familiar to me, but all situations, what might happen? And while I certainly continue to be far from perfect across any of these measures, 
I am more committed than ever to their pursuit. And I have found that in doing so and releasing this, the specific rigidity of the what, the continued pursuit and ongoing attempt to walk through the world in a particular way has created an openness and flexibility and joyfulness, which has ushered in amazing opportunities in unexpected places and a wonderful community of beautifully spirited individuals that inspire me in countless ways. I have to say as a kid, as an example, what I get to do today wasn't even something that I knew I could aspire to become. So this notion of this flexibility and this openness has been um, an incredible blessing to me. Um, I'm grateful to be here with my colleagues from Netflix. Every day I get to work with the smartest, most courageous, incredibly innovative team. I get to work in a place that encourages us to take risks and to seek out new storytellers and voices from around the world, both in front of and behind the camera, that not only entertain, but also to open the world through their individual stories of diverse, powerful, and important new points of view. I feel blessed on many fronts, but where it matters most, to have found a partner and married a man who embodies joyfulness, kindness, and generosity of spirit in an unparalleled way. Together, we're raising a young boy who seems utterly boggled by the notion that the world could ever think of a woman, and certainly any of the eight-year-old girls in his second grade class at Westland School, as anything other than the intelligent, mysterious, beautiful, and powerful little individuals that they are. It feels more vital than ever for all of us to be part of raising not just confident and empowered young women, but confident and conscious young men. I am grateful to Donna and Judy and the entire Girls Inc. team for the incredible work that they do year around and for this special day, which has given us the opportunity to be self-reflective and inspired to be the best version of ourselves. And it inspires me to ask whether there's more I can do to support those around me. Am I limiting them or allowing them to continue to grow and evolve? This will undoubtedly be put to the test next week around the Thanksgiving table with my family. <laughs> I challenge you to do the same. Uh, but I'll leave you with this final story. Um, some of you might be familiar with it, but I think about it a lot. And it's the story of Roger Bannister, who on May 6, 1954, he was the first person to ever run a mile in under four minutes. This is a truly astonishing feat by any measure. But what I love so much about this story is until the moment that Roger did that, the leading scientists around the world had actually established a belief that it was physically impossible for a human to run that fast. However, once Roger accomplished the seemingly impossible, it took less than 30 days, 30 days, for the next person to run a mile under four minutes. That first four minute mile broke not just a physical barrier, but a mental, energetic, and emotional barrier that cracked a path wide open for others to follow. And since that time, nearly 4,500 people have been recorded running a mile in under four minutes. It is said that a major component of Roger Bannister's training was radical visualization. He literally saw himself achieving this goal over and over in his mind until his body followed. It takes a certain kind of person to see what doesn't yet exist. And I think we tend to be able to imagine the worst pretty easily. But what if we challenge ourselves to flip the script and face our own version of the four minute mile? I get extremely excited listening to all the scholars and all of the other honorees and everybody in this room. This is a formidable room full of such impressive women and conscious men. And I wonder what each of us might embrace as our own four minute mile and how wonderful a path might we crack wide open for one another to follow. Thanks for having me.